And it's a perfect opening because here we are in the desert. I don't know, but uh, we just had snow on the ground, but we are in the desert season, okay? And it's, maybe it's a desert time, you know? Um, and it's, it's a blessing to be in, its, uh, in the desert. It's always been a place where growth takes place because we, we allow other things to not, other things are not there to stimulate us and distract us. So we're here to just focus with the Lord and let's open with prayer. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, amen. Lord, thank you for the opportunity for all of us to be together with each other tonight in a Lenten mission, a time where we are all examining our life with you, our life on this earth, and the blessings that you wish to give us, that we may be strengthened. We pray one thing tonight, may our words be your words, a spirit of love fill this church, and that when this night is over, everyone will have grown closer to you than they've ever been before. We lift up in prayer all the special needs of those gathered and other people in the parish that have submitted petitions, and we just ask you, Lord, to just fill us with your light and your love because we are gathered as your beloved tonight. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Welcome. Thanks for coming. Do you remember the cheer? God is good all the time. God is good. All the time. Okay, folks, I enjoyed going through all of your cards. Um, from the weekend, okay, thank you for contributing what you did. I will do the best I can, okay, and maybe at any point, if anybody feels inspired to uh, add something, just throw your hand up, let me know. You, maybe you've been through something here, maybe you have a follow-up question, whatever we can do, okay? Also want to remind you that I will be in the church hall, um, parish hall, parish center, all, uh, all day tomorrow, pretty much, from 9 o'clock till noon and then up until the mission after that. Okay? So I put these in categories, all right? Um, I'm going to deal with the personal ones first. Somebody put on a card just the word help with an exclamation point. I, I don't know who you are, but I hope that you'll come by tomorrow morning or afternoon or or Wednesday afternoon, I would love to talk with you about the, whatever it is that's going on for you, that this is what you wanted to write on the card, that you need help. Uh, I'm praying for you, been praying for you since I got this card, and but if we can talk something through, I'll be glad to be there for you and with you, okay? And remember, if I'm not your person, that you know, you're looking at me and you're like, I don't wanna talk to him, but I gotta talk to somebody, let people at the parish know, all right? They have contacts and resources for you. But whatever it is, there's nothing too big for God. Sometimes the way he heals us, always the way he heals us, is directly through our prayer. Sometimes it can be through his presence in someone that we can trust. And sometimes it's in the presence of a person who may know more than we and people we trust know like a professional person of some kind, a counselor possibly, okay? So whoever you are, there is nothing too big that you know you can't bring it to the Lord and to get help for, all right? Um, this other one, I don't know what you meant, but it says uh, help with food shortage. Um, and I know that there is an outreach program here at the parish, so I guess there are resources uh, that I don't know so much about because I live so far away, but if your problem is a food shortage, uh, we, I'm sure there are people here at the parish can help you. Is that true? Amen. Good. Now, maybe you were afraid of a food shortage because of what's going on in Ukraine. I wasn't sure how you meant this, but we will add this to our prayer list as well, okay, that we don't suffer a terrible uh, food shortage. 
Um, and remember that there is already a food shortage in the world for many of our brothers and sisters. One out of eight human beings go to bed hungry every night. And I pray that we, as God's people, will care enough to do something about that, both locally and, and globally. Now, the next batch of questions, okay, for those of you that are kind of just tuning in tonight, welcome. Uh, this is what we're doing. These cards came in from parishioners, and that's the theme of tonight. The plan for tonight is to go through these cards with you, okay, and then to end with a beautiful uh, Christ encounter uh, guided meditation prayer experience. Okay, so that's what we're doing in case anybody just wandered in and like, what's he looking at there? These are the cards. Three of these cards that came in will be best answered tomorrow night because the presentation tomorrow night is called Bring Them Home. And it is about what is happening in the world that so many people are running away from anything to do with God, faith, church, religion, okay, and how as friends and followers of Christ, we can be an active force to bring them home, what to do, what not to do, okay? But I think I'll just call them out because I want to show you respect for having written the cards. What do I do being to bring back my children to the church? They are 29, 28, 23 years old, okay? Um, we will definitely be covering that tomorrow, okay? Uh, if not, there is a booklet that I also am giving everybody as a gift that you can take, but I hope you come to the presentation. Help our children put God back in their lives. Amen. Everybody, will, we all want that. It's a very strong pain, isn't it, to see people just not having the comfort and the joy and the courage and the, the strength that we have from knowing Christ, okay? Okay. Um, you, you, younger generations are consumed with technologically technology and science. This has taken the place of God for them. What is the solution? And we will definitely address that tomorrow night, okay? Basically what you could do, can I give you a little tip right now? All right? Or you all want to wait till tomorrow? I can tell you this. For those that love science, there's been an interesting development. 85% of the scientists 10 years ago were atheists. Now, 45. What has happened in 10 years, okay, that half the, half the scientists went from being atheists to like, no, there's a God. No matter what scientific discipline they work with, the infiniteness of space, the tiniest of particles, the spin of the earth, the human body, they've discovered that everything is so unbelievably perfectly laid out, that they no longer believe that this all has just randomly, chaotically evolved and ended up this way. They believe that that is the fairy tale. Sadly, not everybody knows this, but it's, it's a weird time because people are running to science and we want the scientists to like, no, no, there's a God. So for anybody that's uh, pro-science, you can let them know about that little fact. A number of you chose to get political with your cards. Okay, well, I'll do the best I can with this without dipping too much into politics. The Phantom request that Russia be converted to the Lord was accomplished. Why is Russia causing war? That's a great question. Um, we believe that the country of Russia specifically has been consecrated one of the first things that Pope Francis did upon being made Pope was to consecrate the whole world to the blessed care of the Blessed Mother. So why, upon the, the Fatima request, having been accomplished previously, renewed recently, what's Russia doing? Um, just as you and I have been committed to Christ, those of us that have, okay, why do we I guess maybe the question is, why do we act sometimes like we haven't been converted, right? I mean, this is an extreme example of this, but I don't know where this man is with God, but I know these behaviors are hideous. And this is a very dangerous time because of his, you know, ungodly action. So uh, I, 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 I think because the consecration was made, it is something that must be embraced individually and as a country. I don't know if Russia as a people have converted to God 
the way Our Lady hopes for. I don't think we have either. I don't think anybody in the world has converted to our Lord to the extent that his blessed mother wants all of us to have in our relationship with him. She wants so much for us, and we are just not there. So you pray. You pray that, you know, that the, the, the conversion of Russia, the conversion of every one of our own hearts is, is continuing and ongoing. And that's why we have Lent as a Catholic family. It's a time to really examine your soul and say, you're committed to God, you're a Catholic, you go to church, uh, but what about this, this, and this? You ever do that? You ever ask Jesus to, you know, to just tell you, well, you know, how am I doing? You know? And you could do that any time. You don't have to wait for Lent. But in case you don't think to do that, this is a period where we all look like, how am I doing? You could do that, and we probably should all do it every night, right? Okay, how do we handle the tragedy of Ukraine and feeling hopeless and helpless? We're not hopeless and helpless. Yes, we can't exactly go in there. You know, if there was not the threat of nukes, our country would be in there. We know that. But as in every other tragic Russian intervention in history, we had to stand back, whether it was Hungary in the 50s, whether it was the Czech, Czechoslovakia in the 60s, whether it's been other top Poland, before that, after that, and then, you know, Crimea, about six, seven years ago, um, they've got the nukes. And that threat to use them has always caused America to act cautiously and with not the boldness that as freedom-loving people we would love to be able to do. So those people are not helpless. They have faith. Have you noticed? They got faith, they got guts. They're not helpless, so we shouldn't feel helpless either. Our prayer... Don't ever forget that. Never stop praying for peace. You know, is one of the major things that people wrote on their, um, you know, prayer list. We have a whole bunch of cards we'll get to either tonight or tomorrow. Uh, we got to keep praying. We're, it's not hopeless or helpless. It doesn't help us to see, uh, to look at it that way. Someone wants to end qualified immunity. I don't know if that's a Catholic issue, but um, it is definitely a political issue, and from what I know about it, uh, I, I think I would agree, but I don't want to get into that too much. The Pope recently said rigidity leads to divisiveness. Do I agree? Ah, great question. You know, the, the Pope, our Popes, and if I look back, John Paul was the same way, willing to engage everybody. If I really look at what Pope Francis does, he talks to everyone. Some people interpret that as being weak regarding his own beliefs. But to engage people who disagree with you, and he did this with both our previous presidents, sat down and talked with both of them, broke bread with both of them. And the idea is you keep a communication going, and therefore you have a chance to influence each other. That's how he looks at it. Some people would say like, no, you don't talk to people that don't agree with your, 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 your theology or whatever. But he models something different. It doesn't make him weak. It doesn't mean he doesn't care about his faith um, or he waters down his faith. But rigidity he's talking about, like when you get so high and mighty up in, in your, all in your beliefs that you create a wall and a barrier to communication. There's a way to be true to your values and ideals and to engage other people that think and feel the same uh, differently. We should learn how to do that. So I think he's trying to, to you know, uh, I think he's trying to say that when your beliefs, your attitude becomes rigid. Not that you should, you know, shouldn't strongly hold your beliefs, okay? But when you get so uptight and rigid about it that you shut other people out and dialogue dies, that's not good for anybody. I think, that's, I think that's what he's saying. I don't pretend to know the mind of the Pope, but I'm thinking that's what I would say if you're asking my opinion. Democrats are pro-choice, and the church never calls them out over this. The president is a pro-choice Catholic. Not a word from the church. I don't know if there's not a word. There's some uh, bishops that have said that they don't, wouldn't give him communion, and there's some bishops that are like, no, that's not the best way to go. 
we're kind of like all over the place with that. It's very sad because he is Catholic. He prays the rosary every day. He goes to mass every week. How he could be on the side of, of this issue. We change sides of this issue in order to get the nomination. That's very tragic. You pray for a person who, who does that. Um, but I, I don't know the church's response, why it is what it is or isn't. I, I can't presume to have enough knowledge about that. How do we handle the tragedy of, of, uh, hmm, of uh, Ukraine? A feeling hopeless. Oh, this is, I think I did that one already. Okay, somebody wrote it in twice. Okay. All right. These are the prayer petitions. A couple of you have some mental health issues or people you care about with mental health issues, okay? Um, understanding why a child would try to take their own life. Um, a very great tragedy is anyone that makes a decision to end their life. How much pain do you have to be in? You see, people that take their lives, including the young, it's not that they want to die, it's just that they don't want to hurt anymore. They don't want to live in the amount of pain that they have. And when a person has a mental illness as a result of the pain of their life, um, they sometimes make that decision. And it's always tragic. Pray for anyone that has been left behind by a person who's taken their life. It's one of the terrible things that comes out of suicide is that those who left, go left behind, a part of them dies too. We went through this not far from here when uh, a year ago, uh, not quite a year ago, but a teenage girl took her life. And a lot of us in youth ministry knew her. She's such a good hearted girl but she was in very deep emotional pain. And she kept a lot of it to herself, to be very honest. You know, there was people that might have stepped in to help her, uh, but they didn't get the chance. And that's always a tragedy for those who love somebody that makes that decision. So it's especially heartbreaking when you hear of a young person with their whole life ahead of them but, that makes that decision, but every suicide should break our hearts. A priest who was helping us all, who knew that girl, heal, told us that some healing can only be done by God directly. And it'd be having in our hearts and minds the image of, of her being ministered to directly by Jesus, that when she left this world. Uh, a lot of us have found some comfort in that, but it still is a human uh, tragedy. When that, when that happens. Someone wrote the word despair. Uh, something I catch a lot of today. Uh, COVID has caused some people to despair. Um, a lot of issues in the world. But if you're feeling deep in despair, I want to encourage you, like I said to the person who said help, please, please talk to somebody about this. Okay? There's nothing too big or too small for Jesus, but one of the ways he heals us is counseling. Anybody got a reaction to anything so far? Any, any question, a follow-up question, or a, a, something you've been through that you can maybe help the person who wrote the card? Y'all good? Okay. Please speak about the sacrifice made by caregivers of disabled children, spouses, or aged parents whose needs limit the life of their caregiver. Amen? We need to just honor all of us that are in this, this situation. Um, whether the parent is aging, the child has a developmental challenge, the person has a mental illness, um, he had never stopped praying for those people. You know what I hope? My niece is um, in Arizona is a nurse and went through so much caring for people with COVID. You know, the caregivers and the health professionals. I hope to God someday there is a, a memorial in Washington for all those people. I think we need to nationally acknowledge the contribution that all people have made from COVID, but also who just serve in all kinds of ways as caretakers. They are real heroes. And, and they need to all get a break 
once in a while, if you know of one, they need a little break, they need a little vacation, they need some prayers. And you pray that they, you know, keep tabs on them. See, how are you, how you, what are you doing for you? Because when you get so caught up in having to care for somebody, you sometimes don't think you got to, you have to renew yourself. Otherwise, you're just going to get burned out, and then you're no good for you or for the person you're trying to help. So that's uh, my little two cents on that. Family division from politics, social injustice, from pandemic, dealing with people not understanding how words can hurt, asking for prayers with this. Um, I'm the oldest of nine kids. Uh, COVID-wise, we were all over the place, okay? Four brothers, four sisters. COVID-wise, I got one sister that only left her property a few months ago for the first time since this broke out. <laughs> I have a brother in Arizona who's yelling and screaming. This was all a democratic plot and a fraud, and there was nothing to it. It was all a bunch of nothing. And most of us were somewhere in between, okay? Even if we didn't want to get the shots, if there were some of us that didn't, we all did for the sake of wanting to make sure we could see our mother safely because to be alone and cut off from her children and grandchildren was very painful to her. So everybody made different decisions. We made one decision that was good. We have a family Zoom meeting that we still do. We had one just yesterday. Three o'clock every Sunday, whoever can make it, makes it. And we decided real early on, keep the politics out of it. And so when someone starts, someone would be like, boom. Nope. We're not doing that. And it's worked. It's, it's worked. It definitely worked. And because some people could be so, you know, emotional and opinionated in a strong way, it was pretty necessary. But I would say, um, you know, there's always the saying, you know, that you don't talk about religion and politics. I think we need to do, remember that more than ever. <laughs> you know, and find common ground. That's what we need to do as people. We need to remember this, things that we all want and need for life to be a good thing, to be a blessing. It's way more important than how you happen to feel about this. This demonizing people who think differently than us has got to stop. This is something our enemies want to see us dragged into, okay? And it's something we just need to choose one person at a time, one family at a time, that we will find something in common and we will see the Christ in each other more than anything. We can do that. Maybe not all the world looks at life like that, but we do. We're supposed to. Okay? That's Jesus. And the fact that you're my brother and sister in Christ is way more important than the fact that we, you know, believe so-and-so was a better president or whatever. Now, this person wrote about divorce. How do you heal from the grief, bad relationships, and how to trust again? after divorce. This one, I, I, can, I can talk from personally, because uh, I've had that experience. It was maybe the lowest point of my life. Um, I never expected my marriage would end. We made a promise on an altar before God forever and ever, and I, I, we had problems, and I accept my failure. I do, okay? But it was shocking, and it was ugly, I, I felt I was disappointing all the kids I ministered with because so many of them came from broken families and I felt like, you know, wow, they had to look and say, wow, even, even Tony couldn't make a marriage work. I was the first one in my family to ever be divorced. There was a lot of shame there, but there also was a lot of self-doubt. How did I make such a big mistake? Um... And again, I accept, I accept all responsibility for that. Um, I had to let that go. How to let that self-doubt go. How to just make sure to prayerfully strive to not put up barriers between myself and people. It, it was a big deal. I want to invite whoever this is that wrote this card that's going through the divorce now. Um, it is something that I, I hope you'll talk to a counselor about. I know that that was a very healing part of my process. Somebody who didn't have answers, 
but knew what questions to ask to help me process this experience. Okay? So uh, I'd like to throw that out uh, to the person who wrote this again. There is life after that experience, and it is a, it is a tragedy. It is it's all, all promises broken, all potential for something beautiful and special when it dies. It's a loss. Allow yourself to grieve it without putting up barriers. That's what we have to do, all of us, with our losses. How do I handle my feelings about family and friends who have very different political and inclusion opinions that I have? I want to avoid them and break away. How do we live in such divisive times? I, I kind of covered that. That was in with the other one. But the common ground, I, got, I did cover it, okay? The common ground, what do we want more than those opinions we differ on? Where can we come together? And I think it's around love and faith. I think our country, until we make a commitment that we're gonna care about each other, everything else is fooling around, you know? Otherwise, the divisiveness, the differences are gonna rip us apart. They already are. How far can you go down this path? So unless there's a major recommitment to like, I'm gonna try and care about you as much as I care about myself, Love is not a warm, mushy feeling, and sometimes it's nearly impossible to have a warm, mushy feeling towards somebody who is getting in your face about how strongly they feel about something that you vehemently disagree about. Love is just willing to stop, and work is good, and it's hard for someone else's well-being as much as yourself. Until we, and we strive to live like that in our families, don't we? In our friendships, our relationships, we have to do it we committed to it in our families and, 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 and friendships and, and also in our communities, our churches, and in our world, our country, in the world. There's a lot, no, no, I'm sorry, there's not a lot, there's two people. <laughs> there's two people, but both feeling very strongly about something that has affected all of us, the church scandal situation. Okay, someone said, still struggling with the abusive priest scandal. Rome and diocese's sexual assault of children, it keeps happening. I know that it does seem to, th things still keep coming out. There was uh, the Cardinal McCarrick tragedy. I mean, God, how that went undealt with so long is bizarre. Just last week, they're on Long Island. There's a priest, what, either arrested or accused or something with child pornography just last week on the island. And then there's another priest on the island that uh, ran off with his secretary that got married. Okay. <laughs> Why are you laughing? <laughs> well, <laughs> I don't know, but it happened. I'm trying to say is when you get stories like that that come out, you still start to feel, isn't anybody learning, you know? And, and the other thing is, is that I think a lot of us feel there wasn't enough of a repentance. There, I mean, this was ugly. This could have brought down, if it wasn't for the Holy Spirit, we'd be over. Do you ever think like that? Do you ever realize that? If it wasn't for the Holy Spirit, we were Walmart, we'd be out of business. It would have come out that Walmart had district managers that were abusing children and headquarters just moved them along. They'd be out of business. And we would too. It's only by the grace of God that we continue, okay? The grace of God, the power of the Holy Spirit, the church of Christ in the midst of human sinfulness. But if you're frustrated and you're angry and these two people clearly are, I hear you, but we got to give that over. Because in the midst of it, there are good priests. There are good people, and this is God's church, and he does mean to renew it for the purpose of bringing his light to the world, his love to the world. And this is a very ugly thing. The church was a very triumphalist, very pompous in some ways, overconfident in whatever it was in those days. Okay, we're all vulnerable, we're all raw, and we all feel ashamed to be part. You'd be ashamed to be part of any organization where that kind of scandal happened. But it's our church. It's God's family. It's the most important thing we belong to. 
So I hear you. But I'm going to also try and encourage you to just really um, ask the Lord to heal you, to forgive. Remember when we say forgive, it's not saying no problem. All the wrongdoings that happened in our church, you know, if you're going to say forgiveness, it's saying, oh, no problem. No, it was a huge problem. People got hurt, damaged. Young people taking their lives because of the abuse that they suffered. And it was adults that when their entire adult lives could never shake it, their mind was poisoned by the experience. It was a very big deal, okay? There was nothing of God in it, okay? So the thing is, is that we're not saying when I say I forgive you, okay? You're saying, oh, let God take care of those people. And then you and I are freed of the bitterness and the anger all the human sinfulness of our church, we're, we're all broken. We all sin. Now, those were very, very serious ones, okay? I'm not saying that's the same as, you know, just being rude to somebody on the phone. Um, but we, we all have our failures. Let's just let God take care of those people and forgive them and let them heal. And, and the thing is um, to just, yeah, receive the, the healing, okay, that we need. And if you're angry about the fact that it wasn't properly repented, that's, that, that, that's legitimate too. I don't feel it was. You know? You all know that if someone, you hurt someone, what, how do you act afterwards? And it just didn't seem like there was enough of that went on. Pray that somebody's hearts will be open to providing that healing for all the people that suffered as a result of it. The young people and their parents and families. You know, that's so, so serious. The redemptive, merciful power of God. That's what we need to anchor in, okay, in going forward. And also being darn sure that we have our eyes and ears open and nothing happens again, amen? All right, I feel as if the, I, I feel, I feel so unworthy of my blessings. Wow. Well, whatever you're doing, please tell the rest of us how, how, to, how to get there, okay? Good for you. You know, you ever, but do you ever feel like this? You know, do you ever feel like heaven? I'm not worthy for heaven. I'm not worthy for this. If you ever let yourself feel what a, a blessing it is to be a human being, to live a human life and this reality what an amazing gift and opportunity and privilege. And you got it, the person who wrote this card, okay? So maybe that's, I want to use you to motivate all of us to ask God to give us, take us through whatever we need to, to live in that space. How blessed we are. What is the cheer that I teach you guys? God is good? I'm not saying God is good when it's going good. I'm not saying God is good when it feels good to trust that he's good all the time. And that could be really hard for us to do, especially when we're in one of those, uh, <laughs> those deep valleys there. Now, at the bottom of that, you wrote, it's hard to feel hope for this world. Uh, every, everything is so crazy. Okay. And, uh, okay, everything is so crazy. Yeah, but you found something in, inside, and that's got to sustain you. And you know what? It is crazy out there. It is, and it seems to have gotten worse since COVID, you know? I mean, the way people parent, the way people drive, the way people shop, the way everything, you know? People are just in extremes, in the highways. You know, you catch it, some people are driving too slow in the fast lane and they don't care. You ever see that? Of course you have. And then there's people driving through like maniacs, okay? They don't care whose life they risk. They're going to drive on the shoulder if they have to to get where they want to go. And then you've got people that are, you know, took the mufflers off of their car. we got to deal with their noise. It's just everybody's a little bit off, maybe very off in every arena. So pray for everybody. Pray the rosary. I keep my rosary in the car. Sometimes it's not enough. I just, Hail Mary, full of grace, get out, you know, never mind. <laughs> Go home and die. <laughs> I know, I'm sorry. I, road rage issues, God forgive me, it's my flaw. 
Um, no, seriously, um, I think we have to anchor in Christ in the times we're in, more than ever. I, I need it. I, I, I found a wonderful book, Jesus Calling. Have any of you ever seen it or heard of it or read it? To, some of you have? I find a little bit thing, a little daily reading. And basically, if the whole book I had to summarize it, it's Jesus saying, um, shut up, I got it. I got this. Stop worrying. I got this, right? Some of you nodding your heads who read it. That's a summary of the whole book, right? But it's a little bit said differently each day and another act of what you might be holding on to that you could surrender to him, okay? But I'm trying to say even with that book and my rosary, it could still be challenging, okay? I'm willing to put myself out there and admit that. Jesus teaches us to forgive. How do we forget? I've, I've come to I don't know... I don't know, people have different things to say about this. I've heard some very good preachers say, if you didn't forget, then you really didn't forgive. And then I've heard some people say that forgive, but don't forget because it'll remind you what you don't want to do yourself or what you just need to not put up with in the future. Okay? So I don't know if there's a universal answer to that. But if you have a feeling that you should forget, because it's going to cause you to build a wall of protection around yourself, okay, then, then, then pray for that. Pray for the ability to let that go. But if you're the kind of person that tends to put up with too much with people, and it's not good for you, and it's not good for them, then maybe pray for the ability to remember selectively when necessary, okay? But don't build a wall. That's the danger. I did that. I didn't, I, when I do talks with kids and maybe even adults, maybe I'd share this with you, that I built a wall around myself from seventh grade through 12th grade. I didn't talk to anybody, nobody. I was the invisible man, that was my game. I looked at people, I was sick of the cruelty, I was sick of the bullying, the disrespect, the superficiality, the backstabbing. I just looked at people and I said, I don't need this. And I wasted six years of life. And that building of that wall, I would never want to go back and relive that. But it taught me how far it can go when you don't forget. Okay? And you don't forgive either. That's what it is. It's a wall of protection. We all need to constantly examine how thick our membrane is between us and others. That the more you invite the Holy Spirit to live in you, the less need you have to unnecessarily protect. Again, there are people that are toxic, and you need to protect yourself and those you love from them. And that's the wisdom gift of the Holy Spirit. Okay? So for those people, don't forget. <laughs> all right? Don't get all rigid and blocked up but you don't want to, it's not good for anybody to throw yourself into those shoes. So I, I, that's how I would respond to that. Uh, I think I did these already. Okay, now the biggest chunk you guys have are the why God section. Why? Why? Like I can never understand the mind of God here. I don't know. I'll give it a try, okay? First of all, someone just wrote down the power of prayer. And I'd just like to give a shout out to the power of prayer. You know, we're not helpless with Ukraine. Pray for those people. Pray for peace. Our lady has been begging us to pray for peace, and maybe we got a little sloppy with that. Maybe we didn't do it quite as much as we should. I'm not saying we're being punished, but I'm saying the power of prayer is great. You know, pray for one thing, that God's will be done. That's your prayer. Lord, may your will be done in this situation. If it be your will, bring about a healing. We all knew of a 17-year-old athlete, this boy, uh, COVID went to his heart, uh, 17 years old, and the kid was supposed to die. And his uh, aunt is uh, a sister, religious nun, and she got a whole bunch of us praying. He started school last week, you know? So there are those miracles, and then there's someone in this church who is feeling, oh, good for that kid. 
but we didn't get the, you know, what we prayed for. You pray for God's will to be done. Uh, there is power in prayer, um, and I just can't say enough about that, so thank you for writing it down. Why does God allow such atrocities to continue? The answer to that, folks, is uh, free will, okay? It can be hard to accept that he is capable of honoring our freedom to such an extent, okay? There are people that feel like, what kind of loving father lets their children do this to each other without stepping in, right? Because we come from that model of what human parents should do, okay? If the way we adults on this planet uh, acted, if you had a family that acted this way, with people accumulating weapons and attacking and, and not sharing and, and just dumping all over the place, turning the oceans into a, a toilet and the, the, the world into a dump, you wouldn't let that happen in your house. You would intervene. So to give you an idea that God the Father just really respects our freedom, but he also wants to work through those who say to him, use me, take me, I'm here. Do we do that? Do we do that enough? Do we willing to say, because we're all ready to complain. We all do a lot of complaining. What's wrong with everybody? Why can't they? Why can't they? Why are they? We do this all the time. There's so much for us to feel that way about. How much do we take the step to say, I'm here, Lord. What do you want me to do? Do you want me to keep praying? Do you want me to join something? Do you want me to start something? You know, we're in the world at a big time, folks. And you know what? It ain't over till it's over. So some of you are feeling like, I'm 60, I'm 70, I'm 80, leave me alone. No, <laughs> we're here. We can do something, okay? What does that got to be for you? You and him work that out. Okay, but always remember, and if you don't like the fact that he's given us so much freedom, have it out. What the heck? I don't like the way you run things. I would do so much better. Okay. <laughs> don't ever do that. <laughs> Here's another thing never do. Could you hit me with one more thing? Last time I did that, <laughs> I was... Yeah, I, was, I was having a horrible day. It was at night, and I was sitting at a red light waiting for it to change, and I was just looking up at this guy. Could you hit me with one more thing? And an 80-year-old man wasn't paying attention, plows into the back of my car and pushed me two blocks. I've never said those words since. <laughs> but yeah, get mad but never slam the door to your heart. You can get, he wants you to get the frustration out. He can take it. He's the Lord of the universe. You want to say, like, what the heck? Get it out, but then, then it's just, what the, but I'm here. Okay, heal me. Give me patience. You know, soften my heart. Give me something you want me to do. What do you want to do with me? You and me together, let's go. That's our religion, you know? Pray for that. Why is it that, that so many people do not know anything about Divine Mercy Sunday and uh, the Sunday after Easter, of course. And uh, you ex can you explain about Divine Mercy Sunday? I don't know what else to say. I'm actually surprised. I mean, I think this place probably promotes Divine Mercy Sunday a little bit more than most churches. You've got a beautiful, big image right here, okay? I saw some cards on the table over here. I hope you don't mind. I took a bunch for my kids in my youth ministry, okay? But it's a beautiful devotion. The Chaplet of Divine Mercy, if you can pray it, I'm going to tell you honestly, tomorrow when we talk about all the things you could do to bring back people who have walked away from the faith, a lot of people out there are praying the Divine Mercy for the sake of their children coming back to the faith. So it's a very powerful way of praying, a beautiful way of praying. I'm happy to su support it in, in that way with that uh, comment. Is redemption possible for those who profit off of others' misery, sickness, and even death? Well, you want to talk about divine mercy, we don't know what happens at death. We don't know. We don't know whether anybody who caused that amount of death and destruction at their moment of death says to the Lord, hey, hook me up with the hell thing. Let's care. We don't know if anybody's stupid enough to do that. The church does not preach that we know for sure so-and-so is in hell. 
other than the demons, the angels that rejected God forever. But as far as human beings, we don't know what happens. Even the most hideous human beings you can think of in your mind right now, we don't know what went on between them and God at the end. We know that there could be a, a very severe purgatorial experience, okay? But the thing is, is there is, there is no such thing as, uh, as, as a block to the mercy of God, providing the person is sorry. We don't know what people who cause that kind of damage, you know, what their souls are, what will happen to them upon having to experience every single person that they did damage to. What a terrible thing for people, you know? And whether they just harden up and say to God, I don't want you, I don't want love, I didn't do enough damage. Or whether they just spend this healing process with the Lord of, of, of purgatory to just get ready for heaven. We, we don't know what they did or do. We pray for peace, but there's always seems to be war. I have trouble seeing God as all merciful. He is. You asked about promoting the message of divine mercy. This was, it's been a horrible era. Human beings have so much more technology, and I think if you really know anything about what's going on with cyber warfare, artificial intelligence, the technology we have, it's even more frightening. And you could either freak out about all this, uh, but human beings have this intelligence, and they have choices about what they'll do with it, and we have a God who has infinite mercy, but also desires to raise up his children and to be protected. How do we do that? We have to find ways, okay? But human beings have always been at war and it's all been ugly. And do we repent it? Do we ever really repent it and say never again? Unfortunately, we might in this church tonight, but there's an awful lot of people that don't have that same commitment. And we're in the world at a very dangerous time because there are political entities in other countries that want nothing but death and destruction for anybody that has to do with in their way. And we're seeing that in Ukraine and we're seeing it on the other end of the world, okay? And it's, it's a time where we better anchor in faith. Better anchor in faith and, and just pray for conversion of souls and for countries Nothing against the people in these places, but it's their evil governments, the evil parties that operate them. It's very scary, unless you anchor in Christ. Oh, why does God allow a man like Putin to execute so much harm on innocent people? Again, we covered that, really. That's the free will question, and uh, pray for his conversion. Everyone in the church, ask yourself, we're all angry at him. We would like to punch him in the face. But how many of us have actually prayed for him? Okay? If you did, God bless you. But it's something that may not come easy for us to do. You know? But we believe that the good we want, whether it's our children, ourselves, our enemies, the good we want happens first on a spiritual level. So there should be no way that we exclude the people that create evil in the world from our prayer. Again, it doesn't mean we excuse it. Just to like a person, the Pope has been in dialogue with him. Okay? Oh, why would he even talk to such an evil person? Because he's trying to keep the doors open for something good to come across and maybe a transformation to happen. You see? So whether it's communication, verbal, or prayerful and spiritual, you keep it all flowing. Because we have a God that doesn't give up. He's more persistent than we can imagine. So you want to plug into that. The big bang and the church. What is the church's interpretation? That's a great question. Okay. Did I impress you as a scientifically oriented guy? <laughs> when I was at the masses, you're like, this guy could do a good science question. All right. <laughs> Let me see what time it is, how much time I got for cover, to cover this. Oh, okay. The Big Bang was actually discovered. It's not a theory anymore. It's accepted as reality. And it was discovered by a Catholic priest. 
who was also a scientist. Um, the thing that's evolved since his whole thing of like everything had a beginning has been verified because there are light waves that they can uh, measure uh, how fast they're traveling and how long they've been in existence and they can now say that the universe began 13.7 billion years ago. That's one of the things that's causing them to throw out the theory of evolution. Because for everything to have evolved to the point where it is, 13.7 billion years is not enough time. Pure, plain, simple, okay? Now the thing that's changed too is that we know, you and I were taught that the universe was these little bits of matter, a star, a planet, a comet. Okay, that's matter, but what the scientists now know is that there is that empty, that's, empty, that's not empty space. The everything in between all of that is dark matter and dark energy. Are you impressed with this? Okay, dark matter and dark energy. And so there is no empty space. In other words, there existed nothing before the Big Bang, which was God's way of starting this whole creative process that we're in the middle of. And God's not done. They, he creates new galaxies, new, new stars every day new galaxies every year. So he's still, uh, he's not done yet. That's what kind of a God we belong to. He's kind of crazy when it comes to the creating, okay? But the church's position is that God created everything. If you want to believe that he created everything through a big bang, okay? One singular event that everything came from uh, that they now have scientifically verified, that, that's what, it's God that did it. Religion explains the who and the why, okay? Science can explain the what. And that did happen, and we now know, and we believe that God did it, okay? Because he could do that. Amen? All right, we're almost done here. Then we're going to do the prayer experience. How do I respond to a friend, uh, a practicing Catholic, who constantly puts down the belief of the church regarding LGBTQ and says the church doesn't welcome them. This is a very difficult issue. We've had a pope that has been very, very strong about everyone is in the family. He has been very adamant, the first pope to blatantly say it, everyone is God's child. We may not approve of everything everyone does, but we don't approve everything that straight people do. So the church is officially stating you don't ever throw somebody out, hatred towards them. They are not second-class human beings. They are members of our family. But at the same time, when we have a teaching that priests cannot bless a gay or lesbian marriage, okay, officially bless a marriage, that feels hurtful to people in the LGBTQ community. It feels like you're telling me I'm in the family, but you can't bless the most important love of my life. So they struggle. They struggle and it can be very hurtful. So try and understand your person who is in the LGBTQ community. It's a very challenging time because it, the, we're not able to go as far as they would like towards full embracing of who they are as people. We've come a, a long way. And at the same time, I, I work with youth primarily. And every once in a while, there will be a, a, a young person come to me and ask me if, I'm go, if, they're, if they're going to hell. And I said, where did you get that from? Because I told a priest in confession that I'm gay. I'm not sexually active, but that's me. And he told me, get out of the confessional, you're going to hell. It happens. It happens still. So we're all over the place with it, but I want us to stay on the track of love everybody. Doesn't mean we approve of what everybody does, but let that be secondary to how we just appreciate each other as children of God. That is what we are supposed to do. So I hope that's helpful at all to you. And if it isn't, we'll talk tomorrow, okay? Age-old question, what does God allow so much suffering? We've covered that, all uh, right? I pray that, um, yeah, he has suffered almost uh, for years. He wants to pray for somebody. Okay, 
for in chronic pain. Okay, and put that on the prayer request, which we're definitely going to get into tomorrow. We'll open tomorrow with the, okay, the prayer petitions, okay? Because tonight we're rolling along here. We want to take time for the meditation. If we don't believe God stricken children with cancer, allows people to rape or kill, allows war and disease, nor can we believe that God causes good. If we do that, it means we have to believe God chooses. It's a pretty interesting argument, but basically God can only do good. He can only love. He can only love. So it's not like he has to choose like, hmm, should I love here or not? He can only love, but human beings exist on this plane where we can be instruments of his love or we could choose to not be. We could give in to our base animal instincts, okay, and rebel against him, or we could be instruments for his love to flow. But he himself, okay, isn't choosing, should I be loving here or not? Okay, that's all he can do. He is perfect love. So that's a kind of a... Yeah, I think that's basically it. Okay, folks? So listen, if anybody here needs more, because I was very aware of how much there was, I think I covered everything, come and see me. I'm here all day tomorrow, okay?